Action Society and author of Real Happiness, a 28-day program to realize the power of meditation. You, as many meditators and meditation teachers, are very interested in the reactions we have to things that we observe and perceive. What does the awareness that comes with the training of our attention that meditation does for us, helps us do, what does that awareness do to our what might be called reflexive or instinctive reactions to things, to events, to phenomena that might, and you write about this quite a bit in this book, that might be informed by um, things that happened in our childhood or something that, you know, we, we carry around with us, maybe on, not on a very conscious level, but incline us in certain ways to react to certain things in, in certain ways. I think it happens uh, in many, many ways. It happens on many levels. Um, and they're really interesting to explore um, because a lot of what goes into our reaction, you know, we say something or we choose not to, or we do something or we don't, or we do it in this way. Um, a lot of it is, it's like a compound. There are many layers and strands that are woven together. And, and I find it just fascinating to pay attention to that. For one thing, they say, um, both uh, certainly in Western psychology and in Buddhist psychology, they would say that many of the habits we pick up or you could say reasonable adaptations for the circumstances of the time. It could be very smart, for example, in some situations to, in effect, leave your body, to not be able to perceive what's happening in your body. It could be very smart to be numb in certain situations, but that may be highly relevant when you're a child using your example, you know, when you're vulnerable in that way, when survival truly is at stake, it may not be that relevant or necessary when you're 45 or when you're 71, you know? And so uh, it's not that we want to dismiss those things or um, dislike them, but realize we might have options now. We have a bigger world. We have more agency. We have more power than we once had. And so why kind of drag around that one ready reaction and not feel the kind of range of what's available to us? So that's part of it. Part of it is that, you know, we're very conditioned and we're taught many things. One of my favorite sayings to kind of take apart is it's a dog-eat-dog world, which is kind of ludicrous anyway, but you know, don't help anybody else on the way up because they're not going to help you. And it doesn't matter what you compromise, what you have to give up, what you have to do, who you have to hurt. Just go for it, you know. And um, and yet, if we believe that, and many of us have that conditioning, have had that conditioning since childhood even, um, what is our life, you know? It's like there is the root of a lot of loneliness and a sense of never being enough and never doing enough and, and if you can see that, that that's a kind of conditioning, it's a habit, it's in effect someone else's story that you have absorbed, um, then when you see it beginning, this is the role of mindfulness, you see it beginning to kind of bubble up in you, you have enough space from it that you can say, really, is that true? Or is that just that old habit? And then you have an option. Uh, to follow it through or, or to let it go. And then there's just um, the habit of elaboration, which I find very interesting too. It's like uh, Pali is the language of the original Buddhist text, and um, the word in Pali is papancha, which means proliferation, or as I heard one translator once describe it as the imperialistic tendency of mind. So that something happens and the whole world is taken over. So um, the story I usually tell is about teaching with my friend, my colleague, Joseph Goldstein. And Joseph and I were sitting in the kitchen somewhere in this retreat having a cup of tea, and somebody came in and said to Joseph in some distress, he said, I just had this really terrible experience. So Joseph said, well, what happened? And he said, well, I felt all this tension in my jaw, and I realized 
what an incredibly uptight person I am and how I always have been and I always will be. And Joseph said, you mean you felt a lot of tension in your jaw? And he said, yes, and I've never been able to get close to people. And it's never going to change. And Joseph said, you mean you felt a lot of tension in your jaw? And it's really interesting for me, like watching them go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, Joseph said something to him like, why are you adding such a miserable self-image to a painful experience? It's like painful enough to feel the tension in your jaw. And on top of that, now you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. You know, so that's another habit we we get attuned to looking for. Not judgmentally and not to put ourselves down, but realizing like, whoa, you know, maybe I'll just come back to feeling the tension in my jaw and, and sort of deal with that, which is the reality of the moment. And so um, there's so much more space that happens and opens up and so much more freedom. And, you know, again, I just make the point, it doesn't mean you never do anything, but the options just expand so much. And the possibility of really being creative in your response actually expands so much. So let's say uh, one is meditating and you're, let's say you're focusing on, on the breath, right? That's kind of one practice and uh, you're trying to notice the breath. Maybe you're counting your breaths and then you get distracted, right? You start thinking about something that's going on in your life. You're worried about something. You're anticipating something. You're thinking about something that happened in the past. Any, any of a variety of, a, a huge variety of, of possible things, possible distractions. Um, and a lot of pe- meditators would be like, darn, you know, that's taking me away from focusing on the present and focusing on my breath. You write that when meditating, the moment you realize you've been distracted is the magic moment. Magic in what way? We say that that's like the magic moment because that's the moment, first of all, we have the chance to be really different. Instead of judging ourselves or berating ourselves or putting ourselves down, we have the chance to practice letting go. One of my Tibetan teachers called it exercising the letting go muscle. So we practice letting go. We practice beginning again. And beginning again is crucially important because I realized that in that movement of kind of formal meditation to life, how many times a day do we have to begin again in some way? Like we fall down and we have to get up or let others help us up. We start over or we have to do a course correction. You know, we go into a meeting and we are sure we know the resolution to a dilemma, but we actually listen and we go, oh, other options, or maybe not, or maybe I blew it in some way and, and let me change let me change course, or uh, we were uncertain and then we move. Um, over and over again during an ordinary day, we are always beginning again and beginning again if we have resilience. Otherwise, we feel stuck. And so I think of all the real life lessons that have come out of my meditation practice is probably the biggest in effect forgiving yourself starting over and and in a way you could then see the meditation as a practice of recovery it's learning how to do that start over with more grace better sense of humor more ease of heart more forgiveness of yourself more self-compassion um and none of those ever have to be talked about they don't need to be articulated. That's what we're cultivating if we're actually doing the practice. And uh, I always liked that aspect too, that it was kind of the silent aid of, of what was going on. The poetic way of saying it is the healing is in the return, not in never having wandered to begin with, which is another life lesson we can we can take with us. And that is Sharon Salzberg. Sharon Salzberg was talking with me about her book, Real Happiness, a 28-day program to realize the power of meditation. I'm C.S. Song, and this is Against the Grain. No, this is not Against the Grain. This is special fun drive programming on KPFA. And I'm delighted to say that Real Happiness, this book by Sharon Salzberg, is yours for a $100 or $10 a month pledge to KPFA. 
Do not go away because there is actually more of Sharon Salzberg I want to share with you. She uh, was one of the first to bring loving kindness meditation to Western audiences, and we have a bit more of her talking about what loving kindness is or elaborating on what loving kindness is. But for a $100 pledge or $10 a month to KPFA, you can get and ask for, you can ask for and receive a copy of the book. The book is Real Happiness, a 28-day program to realize the power of meditation. Again, Sharon Salzberg, she's been teaching for more than four decades, one of the most renowned and respected meditation teachers in the West today. She contributes to Huffington Post. She has her own podcast called The Meta Hour. She co-founded the Insight Meditation Society. This is a trusted, a trustworthy, a veteran practitioner of meditation from whom you can learn a lot. And maybe you learned a lot uh, just by listening to uh, this interview. Um, I want to tell you that there's just too much to too much praise for this book, for this book, Real Happiness uh, by Sharon Salzberg. But I will read a little bit of, of it to you to further encourage more people to come forward and to express their appreciation for KPFA, the kinds of information KPFA gives you. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-TOLL-FREE. Hey, KPFA or kpfa.org. Elizabeth Lesser says, "This I have been waiting for this book, this book, Real Happiness. People ask me all the time to recommend a book that will introduce them to the practice of meditation. And while there are many books written on the subject, none have brought together the purpose, technique, inspiration, and science in such an integrated, intelligent, and personal way. I will be suggesting and giving this jewel of a book to everyone I know who wants to bring steadiness, grace, peace, and happiness into their life through the practice of meditation. That's Elizabeth Lesser, co-founder of the Omega Institute. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. Again, a $100 pledge or $10 a month gets you this thank you gift you are getting more than you're giving. You are totally getting more than you are giving. This is thought-provoking, super insightful, super useful, super practical stuff. Actually, it's both practical and a kind of mind-blowing. Um, if you have not spent a lot of time with uh, Buddhist principles, or even if you have, uh, these words and instructions and guidance um, will, meditations on meditation, uh, will help you get to where you want to go in terms of sitting. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. And actually, you know, she doesn't even say you have to sit. You can walk. You can do other things in order to meditate, in order to tame your monkey mind and focus and pay attention on what's really real around you. 1-800-439-5732. Ethan Nickturn says, simply put, this is an awesome book from a truly excellent teacher. Students constantly ask for recommendations on good books to start and maintain a regular practice, and it's startling how few really complete nuts and bolts practice manuals there are. This book, complete with the whys, hows, and FAQs of practice, is perfect for really accessing the power of meditation. I'll be telling many students about it. And again, Ram Das basically says, no, he did say in Real Happiness, Sharon Salzberg introduces us with a gentle but firm hand to the meditation experience. To those who have taken her courses like me, this book contains all of the jewels of Sharon's teachings plus more. So much to relate to you about this book. But I want to tell you that we are also offering a companion book. It's called Finding Your Way. And it's it's a book not about meditation, but it's a book of life advice by Sharon Salzberg. It's also for a $100 pledge or $10 a month. So for both books, you can get a, a life advice book called Finding Your Way. 
and the book Real Happiness, the sort of meditation why and how to manual, uh, the, the really a, a classic, best selling, acknowledged classic in the field. We're going to go to an interview now uh, with an uh, with Sharon Salzberg, because while the book Real Happiness instructs readers on how to practice loving kindness meditation, uh, this conversation, this more recent conversation I had with Sharon involves her explaining what she means and meant by loving kindness. Well, as a quality, I would describe loving kindness as connection. It's like a profound sense of connection to ourselves and to others it's it's not necessarily a, a highly emotional state at all it's it's a profound sense of connection so you may connect to someone you're having a conversation with because you're actually listening uh and you don't feel these waves engulfing you of a uh, feeling but nonetheless it is it is genuine and it's important because it affects our whole worldview. like if we realize i'm in the habit of creating an other with this kind of person or this, this uh, you know, element of life that I'm not so well acquainted with or just this person that I am running into now and then because they play some function, some role in my life. But I don't ever really look at them and recognize this is like a human being who has hopes and dreams just like me. You know, so it's that moment of connecting. And, and I like to kind of separate it both from high emotion and from action that is mandated. You know, people often say, well, if I were to develop more loving kindness, doesn't that mean I have to let them move back in or give them more money or go visit them in jail? And the reason they're in jail is that they hurt me. Uh, and the answer is no, it's not a particular action that is, you know, mandated by our heart becoming free of resentment and separation and so on. So it's that heart space and it, of course, grows in life as we have different life experiences. Uh, there are many ways of strengthening it. And there is a meditation practice that is usually called loving kindness practice that is dedicated really to the cultivation of that strength. One way to practice loving kindness is, is toward oneself. So you encourage readers of this book and the many people who you've taught meditation to and who you've talked to over the many years to imagine yourself sitting in the center of a circle. Who makes up that circle that you are surrounded by? The circle is made up of all the most loving beings you've ever met or heard about. Maybe they exist in current time, maybe they existed historically or even mythically. And I say beings because it could be like puppies, you know, as well. Um, it's like a circle of love. And there you are in the center as the recipient. And it may be that all kinds of different feelings come up as they are offering loving kindness to you. And, and the way that's done is through the silent repetition of certain phrases. So in this case, with you as the recipient, you may have them say to you, may you be safe, be happy, be peaceful, and so on, whatever the phrases you're using are. And all kinds of feelings may come up. You may feel extraordinarily grateful and exalted. You may feel unbelievably embarrassed. I remember the first time I did that practice, I thought what I want more than anything is just to duck down and have them do loving kindness for one another and forget about me, you know, but Part of the practice is allowing those feelings to wash through you as you steady your attention on the repetition of the phrases. And over time, it becomes a really a beautiful reciprocal flow. You can allow the loving kindness in and you can also extend it outward. And as far as extending loving kindness toward other people, who do we mean by other people? Who should we practice loving kindness toward? Well, there's an arc, you know, and so uh, starting with yourself, which is the classical place to start, because apparently in that time and that culture, no one was easier to offer loving kindness to than yourself. And that, of course, may not be true for anyone at any time. And so uh, you might shift the order, but classically, you start with yourself, you move on to a benefactor, somebody who 
has helped you in some way or inspired you. The texts say this is the one who, when you think of them, you smile. Um, so it's yourself, a benefactor, a friend, and then a neutral person, somebody who you neither know, like or dislike. This would uh, often be maybe somebody who works in a store you frequent that you see now and then, but you don't really relate to much. And then a difficult person, someone with whom there's some conflict or fear. And then all beings everywhere. So this isn't all meant to be done in one single session of meditation, but over time, we want to experiment with these different kinds of categories. And again, the, the benefits of loving kindness, of practicing loving kindness accrues to to oneself, because I guess some people could say, well, you're extending loving kindness to, let's say, a, a benefactor, but that person may never know, of course, that you are you are doing that. You are engaging in this practice toward them. Well, that's true. I mean, the, the benefits uh, certainly accrue to oneself. It's said that the, the biggest arena of the psyche, of the mind, that is affected by loving kindness is the field of motivation. So let's say you have largely been motivated by fear or resentment in things you do or things you say or things you choose not to do or say, which is also an action. And then you strengthen loving kindness as a capacity of the heart and you'll find you're largely motivated by a sense of connection. Again, it doesn't determine exactly what you'll do, but it more molds why you do things, why you say things, where you're coming from. And that's a huge change in one's life, right? Um, and it's also, it happens naturally. It's not like you're in some situation and you have to give yourself a lecture. Like you've been studying this thing for so long and you still, you know, it's like, you're just different. You're there uh, more and more as time goes on. Sharon Salzberg talking with me about loving kindness. Uh, that kind of meditation is uh, an integral part of her book, Real Happiness, a 28-day program to realize the power of meditation. Well, you can do that program in 28 days, or I'm sure she would say 280 days, or in half a year or three years, you can take it at your own pace, $100 or $10 a month to KPFA. That is the thank you gift you can request, one 800 439 Five seven three two. That's one eight hundred. Hey, H E Y, K P F A, or K P F A dot O R G. We also have a second. This is more of a life advice kind of book. It's called Finding Your Way: Meditations, Thoughts, and Wisdom for Living an Authentic Life. That also is available for a one hundred dollar pledge or $10 a month to KPFA. Ask for both. Pledge $200 if you can. Give to KPFA. Give to an information source I'm guessing a lot of people rely on and care about. And get two books, Real Happiness and Finding Your Way. Here's what Bell Hooks had to say. Of all the contemporary women Buddhist teachers, Sharon Salzberg is the most radically open. The one teacher I, Bell Hooks, have met throughout the years whom I can spend lots of time with speaking both about the sacred and the mundane. An acknowledged classic book, Real Happiness, and a book that is brand new, actually, from Sharon Salzberg called Finding Your Way. That's a $200 pledge to KPFA or $100 or $10 a month and ask for either of these, I think, sparkling potentially life-changing kinds of books because uh, I know a lot of people who are into meditation and if I ask any of them, they say, there was me, there was I, there was me before meditation, there was me after I began, after I started, after I got into it, after I learned about it, after I figured it out. Um, no, people don't really say they figured it out. They're still... They're always working on their meditation, right? It's a process. It's it's not something we perfect immediately. But they are saying that it changes them. It changes them. And people around them know and see that it changes them. So a life-changing book. You're getting more than you're giving. Real Happiness by Sharon Salzberg. 
1-800-439-4332, 1-800-439-KPFA or kpfa.org. If you pledge online at kpfa.org, there's a donate button. We save some money when you pledge online that way. A lot of people call and pledge because they are so appreciative of what KPFA delivers that they don't even ask for a thank you gift. And of course, that saves KPFA even more money. So more money of your of yours goes directly to KPFA if you don't ask for a thank you gift. But of course, feel free to ask for any thank you gift, including Real Happiness by Sharon Salzberg. Mark Epstein, MD, says, reading Real Happiness, I feel as if I have, if I have made a new friend or been reunited with an old one. Sharon Salzberg brings meditation to life and, through her grace, shows us how we can come alive as well. This is a masterful work, deep, warm, and engaging. I want to give it to everyone I know. I want to give it to you for something, for some support, for some donation, some pledge to KPFA so we can continue Because KPFA is a project, it's an unusual project, it's a radical project. It is a project of communicating things a lot of people never hear about elsewhere. And maybe you have come to your politics or your spirituality or the way you think or believe, your attitudes, partly because of KPFA or maybe solely because of KPFA. And maybe you think, well, you know... I've gotten so much from KPFA, I want to give back. I want to do it voluntarily, not because I have to. No one's no one's requiring you or obligating you to make the call at 1-800-439-5732 or 1-800-HEY-KPFA. No one's mandating that you go to kpfa.org and give money. This is the beauty of it, right? That you do it of your own free will because you you know that giving is a good feeling. It's an important feeling. It's something that you want to do and you want to do to, you want to give to friends. You want to give to things you care about, things you depend on. And if KPFA is a friend to you, if kpfa.org is a friend to you, if KFCF in Fresno is a friend to you, please give us a call. 1-800-439-5732. What a treat to talk to Salzburg to Sharon Salzberg, you can have her by your side. You can have her in your ear as you read and suck up the knowledge and insight that she offers to any reader of Real Happiness or Finding Your Way. So I have to get going, I believe. I think I heard Kirsten in my ear. Thanks to everyone who's called, and you can still keep calling. Please support KPFA. In. Orwell said that whoever controls the past controls the future. Uh, and whoever controls the present controls the past. So whoever is in charge of our society can decide uh, what our history will look like. And by deciding what our history will look like, they will decide our future. Well, that made history very important to me because it, it meant that history was not disengaged from society, that to create a more democratic history meant that that you were at least playing some part in uh, trying to create uh, a more democratic society. Storytelling for social change on KPFA.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.